Uh. Mm. Something you could have never seen before. I just want to know, like, how many people here have never used Go? Okay, that's good. Uh, but experience with other programming languages, I guess. So I'm not going to start off like super simple. I'm just going to quickly go through the basic stuff and then on to more hot topics. Uh, and last meet that there was someone who wanted to know more about the reflect package. I don't know <coughs> who that was, it doesn't matter, I'll handle the reflect package as well because it's also interesting. Uh, so Go is a compiled language, not like you guys work with Ruby on Rails, you no JS, JavaScript. No JS, JavaScript, okay, you know something. Not big, it's big. Okay, okay. Okay, so JavaScript, okay. Uh, all those languages are interpreted or just in time compiled. Go really compiles to a wide range of native code. Uh, Go is garbage collected also, but most of those languages are. Uh, Go, one of the most important parts of Go, I think, is the playground. It's just play.go.org. The JavaScript and PHP and stuff like that doesn't really have a main function, but if you come from C or Java or sort of Python, you can do that. You have like a main function, which is the entry point. Same with Go, that's where your program starts. So if here outside of the main function, if I start typing something like uh, whatever and I click run, then it's going to complain like you can only have functions in the top level scope. You cannot just execute code like you would do with PHP or JavaScript or whatever. So everything is functions and everything starts at the main function. And you have imports where you, in PHP you have include, in JavaScript you have Node.js you have, you have require, uh, Ruby, I have no idea, I've never done that. <laughs> Here you have uh, imports and you import your stuff usually at the top of your file. Uh, there's a 
all standard libraries. So for example, the FMT package is one of the standard packages that comes with Go uh, and that includes a bunch of stuff like this print line function. Uh, one of the nice things from Go is that it has really good documentation. So uh, if you go to golang.org slash pkg slash fmt, so this is the fmt package, and here I can easily see, just skip all that formatting stuff, that's not important for now. Here I can easily see which functions it has. So in my example here, I use the print line function, so I can see that, oh, it has a, where is it somewhere, print line, and the print line accepts Okay, don't look at that now, and I'll explain that later, but you can see the documentation. And Go itself is also written in Go, so you can even click on the print line function and see the source of the print line function. Now, don't look at the formatting, because <laughs> it always messes up in Firefox, I don't know why there's supposed to be a tab here, but it doesn't indent properly in Firefox. But you can actually see the source of the print function. You can go into all the sort of everything because all of Go is actually written in Go. Like with Ruby, uh, Ruby is written in C, I guess. PHP is written in C. You can't really look if you have a PHP, the, the echo function or whatever print function. You can't really go into the source of that and see what it is doing. With Go, you can always, if you understand Go, you can go into the source code and see what it is actually doing which can be really useful to figure out if something is not properly documented and how, what it's actually doing. Um, okay, back to this example. Uh, Go has the same basic stuff as most programming languages. So you have functions, you have variables, so I can do a variable here. There are two ways to declare variables. I can say variable foo is of type string. I can go, that's, I can say that Go is uh, statically typed, so Ruby is not, right? No, JavaScript is not, PHP is not. Like in PHP, if you have a variable that has a string in it, then a second later you can assign an integer to it, and PHP is just like, okay, whatever, that's fine. With Go, that's not. So if I say, for example, variable foo is a string, and I say foo is 12, and I do run, then it's gonna say, you cannot use 12 type int as type string in assignment. So I cannot assign it, but I can do assign like a blah blah, I can assign a string to it. If now I click run, I'm still gonna get an error because it's gonna say full declared and not used. That's one of the things that is quite different with Go than other programming languages. Go is really strict with everything you do. So in Go, if you declare a variable and you don't use it, it's not a warning or anything, it's actually a compiler error. So you can never have variables that don't do anything. So now I need to use this variable, so I, for example, I can print like that thing, and now it's gonna print blah blah. So now it's not gonna complain because I'm actually using foo. Uh, another way to declare a variable is with the colon is, and this means uh, assign foo uh, to assign something and uh, the language, the, the compiler itself will see which type it is. So now I'm assigning foo with a string, so it will be smart enough to think like, oh, foo is a string. So again, if I do foo is 12, oh, then again it's going to say, no, you can't assign an integer to a string. So it noticed like, oh, you want to make that a string, that variable which sometimes can be very useful, I'll show why. So if I have a function, uh, blah, and it returns a string, so right now I have here, I'm not without looking at the blah function, I have no idea what the blah function returns, but I don't have to give it, I don't really have to know what type it returns. I can just assign it to this variable and it automatically gets the type that the blah function returns. Um, about functions, function always start with the func keyword. And in Go, uh, types are usually the other way around in what people are used to from like C and Java and languages like that. So actually the return time comes after the name, like in uh, Java and C and PHP, 
the PHP is a bit different in that. You would usually write like firm string blah something like that, where the return type comes before the name, but in Go it comes afterwards. Uh, similar with arguments to functions. So if I have an argument uh, a, for example, uh, of type uh, int, that actually the int part comes after the a. So in most languages you would write int a. In Go, it's the other way around. And that's really getting used to it. You start programming in Go, you really have to get used to like, you always have to turn all that stuff the other way around. Um, if I don't use an argument, that's not an error. So I did like an, oh wait, I want some argument. So this is not an error if I don't use that argument, but the variables that I uh, declare but don't use is an error. Oh, by the way, also, if I import stuff that I don't use, also an error. Imported strings are not used. So you can only import stuff you actually use. Uh, Go has basic loops, so let's do something simple here. Let's uh, start uh, with an empty string and then. Um, so I want i is to zero. So here again, I say i. Just assign it with zero and automatically assign the type. I is less than a. So a is that argument that we get here. I plus plus. Let's plus is plus. So as you can see in Go, you can just concatenate strings with a plus. Uh, in Java you can as well, in C you cannot see, you have to always have to do other stuff for that. And as you can see in Go you don't have what you have in almost all languages, these parentheses. I have put these parentheses in, that's not going to work. So you don't have these parentheses. Uh, for loop, the rest looks quite similar I guess. I could also write plus plus i, I don't know what most people do. I think most people write it like this, I always write it like this. So for loop is similar as all other languages, I'm not going to go over that. So if I run this now, I get <coughs> 2 times blah, and whatever, 8 is 8 times blah, 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 blah. Uh, then we have if statement, so let's do something like that. If a is 8, again you see no parentheses around it. If I do that, it's an error again. Uh, I don't know, if a is 8, return 8. Some example just to show how it works. Um, what should we do next? Let's start with maybe some concurrency stuff. I, well, I can go to structs, but structs we can also discuss later. Maybe I do some concurrency stuff, but that's what Go is famous for. Um, so in Ruby and PHP and JavaScript, those are all languages that you usually only have one thread. So you have your code and it just steps through it and it doesn't do anything like two things at the same time. Node.js has two things at the same time, but not really because it's never the actual JavaScript code that does two things at the same time. It's only other stuff that can do two at the same time. Go has really good concurrency. And it is with a Go keyword. So uh, wait, let's write another function. Uh, function blah. F and D dot print print line uh, blah. So with Go, you can do if I do now do blah and then blah, then it's gonna print blah blah. Okay, at this, wait, I have to explain a bit more. Uh, let's do something else. I quickly need this. I'm going to time.sleep, time.second here. So I'm going to sleep for one second and I'll explain it now. So that doesn't really change the program. Now I'm just gonna, like the time package is also built in. Uh, now if I do time.sleep that just sleeps the, the current function, like it waits for one second and then it continues, so the main returns after one second, you, well, you can't even see it here, because 
this labor office who doesn't do that. Um, no, I think the time. Uh, yeah, whatever. So go has the go keyword. So if I do go in front of this, that means the function is going to be not going to be executed in the same thread as what we are on normal code. Instead, it's going to be executed in a different thread. So it will start a new thread parallel to the one of the main function and execute it there. Um, yeah, how can I show that? It's actually a stupid example because it's still. I don't, I don't think see. it works on Think on this. See Okay, I'm going to do different. I'm going to time dot sleep here for one second. Yeah, I'll do that later. Uh, this, don't pay attention to this. Don't. Uh, it's not important for now. It's something that I'll explain later. Really. So right now, I did. Let's, let's do it without first. Oh, and actually, this is going to come well. Mm. Whatever. Thanks, uh, if I do this now, it's going to print blah, wait another second, another blah. Wait, let's make it two seconds, that's a bit more cleaner. So now you see it sleeps for two seconds, prints blah, sleeps again for two seconds, prints blah, because I called the version twice. So there was two seconds. There was two seconds in between each time it printed blah. Now if I do that go keyword in front, it's going to start those both, those, the, the function is going to call it on a separate thread. So those two threads are both going to at the same time sleep for two seconds and print. So now if I do this, it's going to sleep for two seconds, print blah twice at the same time. So instead of those sleeps being Serial after each other, they're parallel, they're next to each other. Um, yeah, we can also do with some global state stuff. I'll explain that now. Uh, you can have global states here, like in PHP, Node.js, you can have global states, Ruby, apparently some. Uh, PHP, you don't really have any state, like after each request, your whole state is gone, and the next request, it starts from fresh, like all your variables have their default value again. With Go, that's not the case. So with Go, we can actually have global variables. So let's say I have a variable uh, uh, i, which is an integer. Uh, at the global scope, I can declare variables. Uh, here, I'm going to sleep for two seconds, and I'm going to print i, and then i plus is two, for example. Um, yeah, I can run this, it's 0 and 2 is exactly what you expect. Uh, yeah, how can I make this better? Wait, no, oh wait, I'm going to write it differently. This is how you do like an infinite loop in Go. In other languages, you do usually while well, true or something like that. Here, you just do a for loop without a case. So this one is going to uh, oh. sleep for one millisecond and then increment i. Now I'm going to make a function printer which is going to loop forever as well. Let's do a bit longer. And okay, so now we have our global variable. We have one function which just loops forever sleeps for one millisecond and increments i and we have a print function which printer function which just loop forever as well and also print i like in any other language i think you would never have a function that loops forever because in php you would get a timeout in node.js you would hang i guess ruby i don't even know would probably also have a timeout or something or i don't know how that's handled in Go, you can definitely have that because I'm starting it in a different Go routine as it's called in a different thread. So, if I run this function, what's going to happen? 
Yeah, okay, so uh, one thing I should tell, it always stops when main exits, it always exits the program, so those threads are always closed through. So this is just gonna, it's gonna sleep for one second, then print I, but in that same second, because this one sleeps for a millisecond, I should have been incremented at least a thousand times. Could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less, depending on how the OS schedules the threads and how long it takes for them to start up. So let's find out. No, exactly thousand. So this thread is running separately, this one is running separately, and they both at the same time can change the global state and do stuff. But this is a bit dangerous, because actually here we're incrementing i and here we're reading it at the same time. Um, if I make it a bit more difficult, to, let's make it... Okay, let me explain pointers first, I guess. Uh, wait, let me start a new playground. Familiar with pointers? C, C++. Yeah, okay. No, not really familiar with pointers. No, I guess not that. Okay, so I'll explain it a bit more. Um, if you have, let's say I print i and I have here i of bar i is an integer. I can say i is 2. That's normal, like normal variable, like you have in every language, it prints 2 here, that's all fine. In Go, like in C, C++, you can have pointers. So if I say i is a pointer to an integer, that means that i is not the number itself, but it's, it's a thingy that points to the number. So uh, what I can do is, all right, let's keep this i actually. <coughs> Let's make for p is a pointer to an integer. So if I do here p is 2, that's going to complain. It's going to say you cannot use type 2, an integer, as a type pointer to an integer. But what I can do here is I can say p is the address is to point to i. Like that's the notation with that is like the upper sum. So now I'm saying p points to i. And if I want to print, if I print P now actually, it's going to print, well, some memory address, like, doesn't make any sense to us because we have no idea what the program layout is. But it, that's the pointer, that's, the P contains the address in memory of I now. So I can print, if I put a star in front of it, I say get the value where I, where P points to, so this is going to print 2 again. Now, if I change i, i is 4, and I print this again, what is it going to print? It's going to print 4 here, yeah, because p is pointing to i, and I change i, so, and here I get again where p points to, and p is still pointing to i, so it's going to print 4, because i changed 4. If I say uh, here, or J is, uh, or I can just say J, assign J with the integer uh, 8, and here I say P points to J, now it's going to print A here because it's not pointing to EI anymore, it's, like it's, printing, it's pointing to J, even if I do like I is 4 here, still going to print 8. Yes. See, yeah, oh, well, that's another thing. <laughs> if here I already say var is an uh, i is a variable of type integer, but here I'm saying again, like I'll declare a variable called i because I'm using the double dot here, then it says no, wait a minute, that's already a variable, so you can't declare the same variable twice. So this is still going to print 2 and then 8 here, so yeah, pointer. Is that a bit clear how that works? So pointer just points to something instead of actually containing a value. If we go back to our example here, I can say uh, make i a pointer to an integer. 
Um, and now let's do something. Well, I can here, of course. Oh yeah, here now because it's a pointer to an integer. I can't increment it because then we will be the incrementing the pointer. That doesn't well, it makes it doesn't make sense in this context. I don't even think that's possible in Go. In C, that would be possible. In Go, that's not possible. Uh, I can also not say i is two because it's a pointer. So here I'm just going to say uh, uh, next. Oh wait, let's do the number is zero. Increment number. No. It's not. Yeah, whatever. Uh, increment the number i is. It's a bit. It's, well, I'm thinking of what's a good way to show the danger here. Okay, I'm going to do i is the number. If uh, the number is bigger than 1000, I'm going to say i is nil. Uh, this nil in Go is the same as undefined, I'm thinking. In, in JavaScript, in Ruby, I don't know. Define PHP. Define <coughs> uh, PHP, you have not really anything like that, I think. So it's like like a null pointer, like it points to nothing. So here I'm saying if n gets higher than 1000, I'm just going to say i points to nothing. Because i is a pointer now, I have to say get the value of uh, what i points to. Now, what's going to happen if I run this program? It's going to first uh, do all of this, that's fine. It's going to count all the way to 1000, then this one around that. Point. Let's make sure it's a bit safe. So, around 1000 again, it's going to print this, that's fine, because i still points to uh, like an integer, because we assign it to n here, that's fine. But after that, after the second, after this has slept for a second, uh, second, a second, second, yeah. uh, uh, i is not going to point to anywhere. So here I'm going to get the value of, well, it doesn't point to anything. So what's it going to do? Thousand crash. It's going to say invalid memory address or, well, nil pointer dereference. So this here is called a dereference. So it's gonna crash because this, I want to print where i points to, but i doesn't point to anything. So this shows that it can be quite dangerous to do stuff in Go routines, because one Go routine can change a value variable or change something, and the other Go routine might not know what changed or might try to read it or do stuff with it. Uh, here I'm going to add something else. Uh, it's a bit weird code, but whatever. Here I'm going to say if i is bigger than you know, 500. No, wait, let's do 2000. Uh, let's, let's, let's. What should I do? What should I do? Sorry, I'm thinking of a nice example. Uh, thinking of a good example of a mutex, how I can do this here. Okay, wait. I'm going to do a bit different. I'm going to do. So I'm going to say i is nil, then I'm going to say time dot three. Time dot micron second super short sleep just to pretend I'm doing some work and then I say I is okay so now I set I to, to nil to point to nothing I do like a little bit sleeping, like really short sleep, just to pretend I'm doing some work or whatever. And then I set i to a value valid pointer again. Now if I run it, it might crash because this print can be executed anywhere within this loop because it's at the same time concurrently next to it. So if this print is executed 
uh, here it should be fine if it's executed before this it should be fine if it's executed after this it's gonna crash if it's executed just before this it's also gonna crash but if it's executed after this again it's fine and we have no way of knowing exactly when that's gonna be it completely depends on your operating system so let's run this see what happens i hope it crashes my my <laughs> why it says that but it should take only four seconds anyways yeah okay I think I know sorry my like microsecond it doesn't look like a mic I'm using too much CPU I yeah. guess because this is executing on like one of Google servers okay but here we see <laughs> it crashes luckily so apparently this uh, this print line is executed somewhere here where it was not safe, where it was set to null. So we need to make sure that this value is always valid when we execute this. One way to do that is a mutex. So I'm including the sync package, which is something that's also uh, included in Go by default. I'm going to say m is a sync dot mutex. Oh. Anyone know what mutexes are? Anyone don't know what mutexes are? Okay, so a mutex is something to uh, lock. Well, I'll just write it first and then I'll explain it. So here I'm going to do lock. So maybe from this code you can already guess what it does. So a mutex has a lock function and an unlock function. And when I lock the mutex, no one else can lock it at the same time. So in this case, if this one is locking it, and this one is done with it sleeping for a second and also tries to lock it, it can't. It will wait, it will block here, it will just wait until this one that locked it will call unlock. So only one of the multiple go routines, threads that you have can lock the mutex at the same time. So what we just had now, where it was sometimes the with this print was executed somewhere in between here, that's now impossible because I lock it here, I make it nil, I sleep for a little bit, I give it a valid value again, and I unlock it. So, and here I also I lock it, then I read the value, then I unlock it again. So now if I run it, it's gonna be fine. Now you can also see that it's like not exactly uh, one second, does not contain exactly. Uh, thousand milliseconds apparently because how they run next to each other so with a mutex I can lock so in Go it's very important that if you have multiple Go routines multiple stuff happening at the same time that in the right places if you like do stuff with shared state as it's called you always make sure you have a mutex to protect that to make sure you're not doing stuff to the same variable from different places and actually the way I wrote it just now as well, if I just write, uh, I'm not gonna remove this all, but actually my old program where I was just an integer and this one was only doing, this one was only doing I++, and this one was only printing I without the mutex. This one worked, remember? Well, we're not building n, so we have to comment it out. This one was working perfectly fine. It takes too long. Why? To, uh, oh, because of the loop. Uh, yeah, it's a light one. So it's 
So this program worked, where we just incremented i and sleep and nothing special, and we don't use any pointers. This works, but it's actually still an invalid Go program, because this thread here is incrementing i, and this one is reading it at the same time. And if you have like a system with multiple processors, then that's undefined behavior, that's what they call it. Even in C, if you do stuff like that, that's not, it's allowed, but it can result in undefined behavior. So never do that. Always use a new text to protect stuff. Um, I think next I'll go into some HTTP stuff, because I think that's what Go is uh, most used for, I guess. Go is really a programming language for on the server to handle like I don't know, HTTP requests, uh, long running processes, stuff like that. Uh, I can write my code in here in the playground, but of course this is executed on the Google server and Google doesn't allow me to open like an HTTP server port or whatever on your server, obviously. So if I would write my HTTP stuff in here, then I can't really use it. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to switch to a terminal. Okay, so HTTP. Go has all the HTTP useful stuff built in. Uh, if I go to, again, this is a golang.org package net HTTP. So in my program as well, I should actually import nets. So HTTP is another package that's included with Go, comes by default. A uh, lot of documentation, like really a lot of stuff it supports. But let's always start with the basics. Let's start a simple server. I can look at these simple examples and I'm seeing here, hey, this is a server. So I need to do something like this in my main. So I want to uh, listen and serve port 8080. Yeah, sure, whatever, that's fine. And I need to give it a this. And I'm going to say, uh, I, I, I register a handler function on, let's do just slash, uh, we call it index handler. And now I need to have a function index handler. I don't even know from the top of my head what it needs to have as arguments, but apparently an HTTP response writer and an HTTP request. Here you see again, it actually received a pointer to a request as argument, not the request itself, but a pointer to it. Uh, Maybe I should do structs first. Okay, wait, I quickly explain structs first. Uh, so in PHP you have classes, in Ruby you have classes, okay. <laughs> in JavaScript you have objects or whatever you want to call it, weird stuff. In Go you have structs, you don't have classes, you only have structs. So in Go, I can say uh, type oh, type uh, foo is a struct, and it has some members. It has a member uh, uh, blah, which is an integer. C again, like the integer after the name uh, blah, and uh, whatever bar is a string. So I have a struct, and now I can say here. Uh, x is of type foo, and I can say if that in that struct blah is uh, two and bar is uh, I don't know x x. This is very similar to which are other languages in PHP. I don't even know exactly. I almost never write PHP anymore. Uh, but in other languages, you would have something similar where you just say, like, okay, this is class foo, and then it has arguments. Uh, I can print this, it's gonna print something nice where it says, like, oh, it's like, I don't know, some object with x2 and xxx. X, x. Um, I can do uh, oh, x dot blah is a 4 if I want to change stuff similar in other in PHP that would be the, the arrow thingy I guess but in Go that's always the dot 
Um, I can also add methods to foo, so I can say func, and this is a bit different notation than other languages. Uh, f foo uh, method uh, print me, I don't know. Or, uh, oh wait, I do set blah, and then new blah integer. F dot blah is new blah. So as you can see in Go, if you add, if you have a normal function, you say func and then the function name. If you want to add a function to a struct, you say func, then between parentheses the name, so that in JavaScript that would be, you would have self here or this, I never know the difference. So this, I think. You would have this. In PHP, you would have self, I think. <laughs> so this basically, so f is just the instance that I, uh, of it, and of course arguments, all that stuff. So here I can say f dot blah is new blah. So now instead of saying x dot blah is four, I can say x dot set blah four. Right. It's Oh, okay. So, that's an interesting. I didn't even think of that. That's interesting. So now I'd say it's set plot four, but it's still printing two. Why is it still printing two? Because here I have a x variable x contains two. I call set plot, but here variable f contains a copy of x. It doesn't contain a pointer to x. Now it gets a copy of x. And here I change blah on that copy of x. So I'm not changing it on x, but I'm changing it on a copy of <coughs> x. So that's why we need pointer. So here I want you to actually change x with set blah. So instead I say I don't want a very I don't want foo, I want a pointer to a foo. And now if I run it, it's gonna say four. So now the syntax here stays the same. In C++, for example, there would be different syntax then. In C++, you would have to do this all of a sudden. I don't know why. <laughs> so here it stays the same. So now it's calling this set blah function, but instead of calling it on a copy of x, I'm getting a pointer to what I'm calling it on. And that means I can all of a sudden change the stuff. Um, that's all you need to know about structs. Uh, there's no such thing as a constructor, which you have in almost every language. Go doesn't have constructor. Uh, there's almost all of it. So now I can go back to my HTTP, and you would can probably recognize that this is probably some struct, and this. So here we have a pointer to some struct. Um, I can do here print line uh, index handler requested. Okay, I have this. Uh, let's open a new tab. Go run. So now I'm not using the playground, instead, I'm using this normal terminal stuff. Uh, go has this uh, handy uh, go command which contains everything. If I do go run and then my file, what did I call it? Test.go. I do go. Cannot use it. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, wait. Yeah, sorry. Oh. I need to do here. Handle. Let's clear this. Okay, it doesn't say anything, so apparently it's running. Um, if you look at the documentation, which we're not going to do now, you would see that listen and serve, which I say here, is just blocking, it doesn't return, it just keeps on serving HTTP requests. And every time I do an HTTP request, it will call this function, but in a different Go routine. Because obviously it can't call it in this Go routine, because this, well, it could, in theory. Anyway, it's calling it in a new Go routine. So let's do localhost 8080. What's that gonna do? It's gonna return nothing, of course. But here we should see our oh, index handle requested. 
actually twice because most browsers also try to request the fab icon but eco file and well we we said here uh, slash means just get all re all HTTP requests so also the fab icon was also in there uh, here we're gonna say uh, let's do something else let's say print F uh, I think, I hope most people are familiar with printf and like most languages have that, except for JavaScript. Uh, here I'm gonna say print, uh, I want a string and then an article and a new line of course after it. So we have here as argument we get an HTTP request. So well, let's see what HTTP request has that we might want to print. So we go to the documentation of type request. Oh, it has a method, it has a URL. Oh, okay, let's print out the URL. So, r.url, but URL is also another pointer to some struct. So, we can look at oh, what has that URL struct then? Oh, it has a whole bunch of stuff like the host, the pod, the query, whatever. But I happen to know that it has like a string method. So, let's do a string that actually prints it. So I run my program again, it compiles, it runs, that's fine. Actually, I can't see now if it compiles or runs, so just to be sure, uh, let's do it here like uh, FNT or print line starting. So now when I run it, it's gonna print like all starting when it's actually running. Now if I request this file again, it's gonna print index handler slash, or if I do like a slash uh, foobar it's gonna print all oh, your requested slash foobar so in i don't know like seven lines of codes i can already handle http requests now of course we want to print something back so we have here a response writer what can we do with a response writer i go back to the documentation again type response writer that has a method header where I can set the headers I want to return and it has a method write. Ah, write has an array thingy byte. Let's discuss that first. Uh, in most languages you have arrays. In Go you also have arrays but you're mostly always working with slices. So I can say uh, bar A is a slice of integers. It's again the opposite of what you would have in most languages. In most languages like C for example you would always write uh, an array of integers. In Go, uh, sorry, an int array is what you would write in most languages. In Go you write an array of integers. Um, I can also do an array of integers and we start off with one, two, three, four. If I print that, ta -da, it's gonna print array one, two, three. If I want to add something, go has the append function. So a is append a. So append returns a new array or new slice, however you want to call it. And so I want to assign that again. I want to add four, five, six to it. Uh, five six seven run and now I get the array with all of those things we can also do like uh, print the I don't know the fourth element of the array it's similar to PHP similar to all, all other languages uh, so the, uh, the fourth element is apparently five it starts at zero so no weird Lua stuff where you start at one does Ruby start at one? No. MATLAB one. Huh? MATLAB. MATLAB. Nice um, <laughs> in Go we can do a little bit more advanced stuff as well. So I can also say I want to get a new array back with... Okay, so let's do it here. I want to get a new array back starting at 2, element 2, ending at element 4. So now if I print A, it's gonna print... 3 and 4, because that's what was starting at. I should have started here with 0, of course, and it's going to print 2 and 3. 
Oh, the format button is also very important. Uh, I didn't even explain that yet, but in Go, everything, all the code you will see everywhere is always formatted the same. So no discussions over all oh, apps or spaces or new line here or whatever there. Go, you normally always format your code and it's always the same. So if I do here space, 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 and I format, it's still going to make it back into a tab character. If I say like, uh, oh, I actually want this here, that's how I always do it. No, you format your code, or oh, it's even going to give an error. Like that's not even allowed in code. Go is really strict with what's allowed. So no discussions over formatting of code, always the same. So this always here. Um, what else? Uh, if I here include some other packages, I don't know, mod, log, something like that. Format, always sorted alphabetically. Uh, other stuff. Oh yeah, uh, if I go do like this. So I want everything on a new line. That is allowed format, that's fine. But not like JavaScript where you have like, oh, should that last comma be there or not? <laughs> no, if I run this, it's gonna say, no, you need to have that comma there, not allowed. So no more discussions about comma there. A uh, lot of other stuff as well. Um, if I say uh, A is 12, who is uh, 13 or 14, whatever. If I format this, it's going to be like this. Some people might like to do like this, like where you align all your is signs or something. No, if you format it, that's not allowed. It will always do like this. Um, another thing you have in Go is maps. I might as well explain that as, uh, at the same time as well. So I can also have a map. So far A is a map of, uh, for example, int to string. So in PHP, what in Go is a map in PHP would be just also normal array. <laughs> uh, in JavaScript would be an object and in Ruby would be also an object or uh, a map, okay. So this is just like key value. So the key is the integer, the value is the string. So if I have this, I actually, now if I do a2 is full, this is actually not going to work, run, it's going to say, oh panic, it's crashing, assignment to entry in a nil map. So I actually have to create the map, so what you would usually do is, a is make a map. Um, so when I did, I can do it like this maybe. When I do var a is map in string. Now I'm just declaring a variable. It's not doing any memory yet. It's not doing anything yet. But if I want to use a map, then I have to like initialize it. It needs some memory to work with, some stuff like that. So I have to make it. So if I do this, that actually works. If I already know two needs to be full, I can also make it a lot simpler. And I can say a is a map from int to string, where two points to full. Oh, again, comma at the end, always required, not optional. Run, this is also gonna work. Um, if I do string to int two and then very oh, sorry, to three, run that also works of course but if i format it it's gonna align them don't ask me why it wants to align this but it doesn't want to align variable declaration someone decided that now everyone does it so uh if i go to any go project uh what's a big go project uh i don't know i like fast http oh don't look at the, oh, don't look at the code itself. But I don't. I'm not going to explain what it does. But if I just some random project and I open the code, all formatted with tabs, everything like um, I don't know what's a big file here. Uh, all sorted alphabetically. 
like everything here you see that here is a map or no structs like all those things it's always every Go code you will find online always formatted exactly the same um, let's go back to this thing oh wait here so we wanted to write something to the output with the HTTP request and we had this response writer here and we looked up the documentation for response writer and we saw it has a write with, let's make it a bit bigger it has a write method which accepts like an array of bytes um, okay uh, you have to know in Go, sorry, small detour again, Go has strings like you have here, uh, but a string is actually, in other languages, it would be an array of bytes. I can see it's an array of bytes. In JavaScript, it's not at all an array of bytes. In uh, PHP, you can use it as an array, a string, actually, if you want. Um, here, it's also an array of bytes. So if I have an a uh, string, I can say b, for example, is a byte array of a. So, and now I'm casting a to a byte array. And then I can do other stuff. I can print it again. If I print this, it's actually going to print all the ASCII characters. So now it's an array of bytes. It's not a string anymore. Of course, I can cast it back to a string again, and it's going to print it as a string. Uh, but so, a um, String is actually an array of bytes, and an array of bytes can be a string. So, what the write function here in the HTTP response uh, accepts an array of bytes because you might want to return binary data in your HTTP response. You don't always want to return ASCII data, you don't want, always want to return like a normal, normal string, but you might want to return other stuff. But we are only interested in writing something simple, so I'm just going to cast a string to a byte array and then my response okay save run it again yeah it didn't crash maybe. so now when I do this hey it's all oh, that's not it says here my response so it just wrote that to the output like I wanted here exactly here and I can do all kinds of interesting stuff. Uh, let's do a global variable. Uh, counter is a zero. And here we're gonna do counter plus plus. Now I have an integer here, but I actually, I, I, I will want to print it here. So we have to convert an integer to a string. Go, because it's static, it's yeah, statically typed. So we can't just say, uh, here, yeah, let's do a, my response is uh, and now I can't just do this. If I do this and here uh, I do uh, the delphite version of my thing. Oh, actually, when I save my Vim already tries to compile it or whatever, it's going to say, oh, actually I made an error here. It should save, yeah, because it's only formatting on save. But if I try to compile it, it's gonna say cannot convert this, which is a type string, to a type integer. Because if I'm trying to add like a string and an integer together here. So we actually have to format it. So no easy stuff like in JavaScript or PHP where you can just interchangeably concatenate integers and strings and everything together. No, we have to import the String, com string conversion package and now I'm gonna say I want to format an integer which integer counter which base do you want it in 10 so again if I go to the documentation of the string conf package you'll see I type string conf in my uh, address bar and it already suggests this thing because when I'm writing Go I'm constantly going back and forth to the documentation so those are one of the most visited pages in my history. Here we can see we have a whole bunch of functions to uh, format integers or floating point numbers and we have also to parse integers and here you can see if I do format in it wants to have the integer and it wants to have a base uh, in Go also because it's statically typed you have different types of integers so usually here you have a, a 64 base integer a 64 bits integer we're going to see that here now 
uh, here I'm actually not saying which type it is, so it's going to infer that I want a normal integer, and a normal integer in Go is 32 bits. Don't ask me why. So this will save, yeah, fine, but if I run this, it's going to say, hey, you cannot use counter, which is a normal integer, as a 64 bit integer. So in Go, I have to cast it. And of course, when I cast a 32 bit integer to a 64 bit integer, that's fine because it will just zero the rest and that fits. If I cast a 64 bit integer to a 32 bit integer, that's a bit more difficult because, well, not difficult, I can still do that, but you might like to lose something. So in Go, even integers, the different bit sizes, you have to cast uh, manually, not like C, where in C you just, if you have this bit number of bits in a number or whatever you assign it and it works the compiler automatically casts it for you go is very verbose so you have to manually cast it so this should work and it does it's a starting so now i do hey this is the number one two two four five so here you can also see that Normally, what you would have in other languages, in PHP, you would, for example, only have this. In PHP, this is not possible like this. If in PHP I do a counter is zero, counter plus plus in a request, then it's always done for one, 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 because every time you have a new request in PHP, this gets reset. Uh, in other, some other languages as well, in JavaScript, not in Node.js. So, this is another nice example of this. Um, we can do more stuff. Uh, let's say uh, last visitor uh, is a string. So in this var block, I can say is and then uh, some initial value, or I can give it a type. So now I'm saying var last visitor is a string. Uh, <coughs> let's do something like. Uh, yeah, too bad I can't make my address bar bigger. Uh, I'm just... Let's see, how can I make that nicer? Should I just quickly write some HTML? I guess I could. Okay, let's quickly, quickly write some HTML. You are visitor number room, and then I'm going to plus uh, uh, form with an input type. Is button and I want an input type is text name is uh, name is name why not form uh, okay now actually when I'm going to run this I'm actually getting back like this. I, I don't want this, I want my browser to understand this. The issue is that I never told it anything about the content type it needs to return, so it's just thinking I'm returning a text content type. So if I go to my developer tools, which are going to be way too, slow, uh, too small as well, and look here at the network. So actually here it returned, blah, 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 where was it? Here, content type, explain. We don't want that, we want HTML. So I have to say that it's HTML. Can go back to that response writer thingy we had here. Has a method header. Okay, header. Header returns the header map, which will be set by a writer. Okay, so we don't header, which returns a map for some reason. What is the header map? Header map here, you see, oh, it's a map from a string to an array of strings. That's complex, but oh, it has a simple add function, or does it have set? Yeah, it has set. So let's do that set content type uh, text HTML. Okay, that should do it. So now I'm telling it like, oh, let's return some text HTML on the You can do any other headers and stuff or whatever you want. Uh, let's clean this again. Okay, that compiles, it's fine. So now when I run this, oh, it's gonna do this. So I'm Eric, by the way. Uh, oh, submit button doesn't have anything there, but I can press it and it's, it's not gonna work because I miss all kinds of stuff. Uh, submit. I don't know. I, uh, 
values of names. No, you said type. Yeah, type. and the form needs to have like a. I remember right HTML anywhere. Oh, what is it? Like an action, action, action yeah. is a slash or something? <laughs> or maybe it's to be actional. Yeah, yeah, slash slash is. Meta this post. Whatever. No, let's do meta this get. That's possible, right? Last time I wrote HTML, that was still possible. <laughs> So here okay, <laughs> submit. No, it's yeah. not gonna work. Yeah, so why can't I? The button has to be the type is submit. Yeah, and then stop. Oh, <laughs> ah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. In the program again. We bash. Yeah. And submit. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. So well, now it has name is Eric in the query string. If you can see that, I don't know. How can I? There is this web combination to zoom in, right? Yeah, I think it's a Yeah, I think I have all that stuff disabled. But it's yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it actually here we can also see, oh, it requests that the name is Eric. So let's try to get that Eric value out of there. How can we do that? Uh, we remember we had here that added URL. So if we go back to the documentation of request, Request had like a URL, which was a pointer to some URL. And that URL, what did it have? That had the raw query. Encode the query values without the question mark. It's a string. Okay, uh, let's save that for now. That might be useful. Now I know the URL package. Now I, it's a string. Well, by the way, I should have said that. So it's a string, so I'm not getting key value, I'm getting a string. So I actually want to get like key value something. So I know here it has values, parse query. Ah, oh, that sounds interesting, parse query. So this is in the net URL package. So let's import the package, net URL. And that had URL dot parse query. What did it want? It just wants a query string and return values. Hey, that values sounds uh, the same as that header values. And an error. Oh, yeah, this is another thing. Uh, small detour again. In Go, you have multiple return values. So if I have a function foo, I can say that returns an uh, integer. Return uh, uh, 42. And I can say here a is foo and print a. That works, we know that already. But I can return multiple values. So I don't know, does Ruby have that? Okay. <laughs> well, you have JavaScript doesn't have that, PHP doesn't have that. So I can actually open a bracket here uh, or, uh, and I can say return not only an integer, also return, I don't know, another integer. So I can say return 42 and 12. Now if I run, it's gonna say, oh wait, no, multi-value foo in single value context. Hey, wait, I'm assigning two values to one now, that's not possible. So in here I need to do A and B. If I do run now, it's still not gonna work. Why is it not gonna work? Because I'm not using B. So, okay, let's print A and let's print B. Ah, that works. So 42, 12. So in Go, you can have multiple return values. I can have as many as I want here. I can say uh, many integers or, I don't know, an integer and something else. Here we saw in the URL package, if I parse the query string, it returns those values, a value object, and it returns an error. Error is also a built-in uh, value in Go. So if I do it here, error, that's also something most... Uh, Functions in Go would return usually, uh, if something can go wrong, they will return their normal value and an error. Uh, Go doesn't have something like exceptions, so it has something similar, but it's not gonna. Okay. Sorry? Something like that, test you do have to. Yeah, so you cannot try catch in Go. It's usually in Go, it's normal to always return an error. So here I will do so, for example, uh, I don't know. Uh, if uh, if 42 is not 42, <laughs> well then the stuff is really wrong. So I'm going to return zero, and now I need an error. So one of the ways to get an error is to say the FMT package has that error f. 
So I want to format an error and I can say like, oh no, 42 is not 42. Uh, it's, and then, I don't know, I can do here a, a, an integer 42. <laughs> it's a really weird code, but whatever. <laughs> so now, and here I say, okay, if 42 is still 42, everything is fine. I return what I am usually returning and I just return nil. So this is usually why you do it in Go. You return your actual value, what you're mostly interested in, and an error. And if everything goes well, you return nil here. So here I would usually do uh, catch that error. If error is different than nil, then oh no, something went wrong with foo. So uh, I don't know. I can actually, I can print the error or I can do print something formatted like uh, something went wrong. And for example, I can do this. Um, here you see a percent %d prints an integer. Go also has percent %v, which is just a catch-all for any type of value. So if I do percent %v here, then it's just gonna print the string value of this error. Like this, and then else, I print this. See, I didn't format it correctly, but I just pressed the button. So this, well, hopefully, oh, undefined b, yeah, of course, we don't have that b anymore. We don't get a return, uh, hopefully it prints 42. Yeah, okay, 42 is still 42, everything is fine. So here, the parse query, where we're gonna parse like that name is Eric, it returns those values and an error, because if some string is not properly encoded or something for a URL, then it will should return an error. Uh, another useful thing in the Go in the documentation, a lot of times you also have examples, so uh, this example kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, okay, I quickly show you a better example. Oh wait, here we still have that string conversion package. Here we have format int with an example, and here the example is actually runnable. So if I press run here, you're gonna see, okay, here in minus 42, and then it's formatting that base 10, so we should be minus 42. And it's also formatting in base 16, and then you see it's minus 2a. So a lot of uh, stuff in Go, a lot of uh, documentation has runnable examples in it. I can actually start editing this example as I will. So with a lot of stuff, I usually look at the documentation, I'll open the example, edit it like a little bit like I want. But yeah, T is definitely not a number. And then, oh, then once it's fine, I copy it back into my code. So, um, where is my, I, okay, so, parse query we have which returns values and an error as well, okay, so, I don't know, like, uh, Q, like from the query values, Q, Q, B, and error oh, is parse the query. Now, okay, maybe it's an error. So if error is different than nil, then I should probably do something else. Uh, what can I do? What can I do? Uh, let's go back to the response writer. Another method it has, oh, right header with a status code. Oh, that's interesting. Let's do a new right header. So let's do, uh, anyone know their status codes from their heads? Like what's 500? The best one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, internal server error. So oh, let's do that. Actually, if you don't know that kind of stuff, it's usually normal to use uh, it somewhere in the documentation here, constants. Yeah, so here you actually have constants for everything. So maybe I just did 500, which is internal server error. That's not really accurate. I would rather say it's something like bad request. What is bad request? Yeah. Status bad. So instead of writing 500 here, I can do status dot to be bad request. And of course, I have to do this return statement here because if I don't do this return statement, we would still do all of this. So okay, I, I'm handling my error. That's also really important in Go. Always handle your error. So if something returns an error, always do something with it. Like I see a lot of code online where people just completely <laughs> ignore the errors because they think, like, oh, it shouldn't go wrong. Always handle your errors. It's a little bit for both, because if you get like a lot of functions, like here you have something else with the 
also an error, just some quick example code. Uh, error is nil. Like you can already see, this is a lot more <coughs> code than if I would just have, uh, uh, like in other languages, you would probably do this, and then all the way at the end, you would do like some kind of catch, uh, whatever, block. In Go, you have that. In Go, the most. Oh, in Go, I think the most common line you have is this line if error is not new, because you see it everywhere all the time. Okay, so now I have that QV. What was that QV again? Uh, in uh, my uh, request, uh, the URL, and then what did we have? Like we had that part here, query values. Okay, what does values have? That's a map of a string to an array of strings. Oh, I have an example here. Actually, this adds stuff to it. So it actually, you can also use that thing to build a query string. So here you can see it, it has empty values. It sets names to Ava, friend to Jess, Sarah, and Joe. And then it results in this query string, apparently. But it also has the get. So, oh, this is exactly what we need, get name. So let's say, Last visitor is qv.get name because here I said I put my name in name. Yeah, sorry for this. I am allowed to put this on the next line, but if I format it now, it's in the middle. So, okay, last visitor z. Okay, you are visitor number. Mm. The last visitor was. Last visitor. Okay, maybe we should do some uh, break in there. Okay, this should work. Let's see if it actually does. Let's compile. Let's start with nothing. Okay, last year there was no one. Why is it no one? Because it starts off as like an empty string. Oh, now I'm Eric, so submit. Oh, number two, the last year there was Eric. Oh, Hank, really touch him, by the way. So, oh yeah, now I, I get something out of the query string and I use it. Uh, is this still, can people still follow it? A bit, at least. I hope so. Um, yeah, what else do we want to do? Uh, I don't know. How much more time do I have? Uh, I think it's better to see anyone. I mean, asking questions is the next time for us to be able to answer those questions. Yeah, the last time someone was interested in the reflect package. I can still quickly do that, but it's a bit more advanced topic. Yeah. Maybe. Who was interested in Reflect? You. Ah, okay, let's quickly do that. <laughs> okay, let's quickly do that. Uh, I'll try to explain everything I'm doing. So let's write this code. Let's finish this code. So here we see I have a, a structure, a type product, which has a name string and a price, which is a floating point. <laughs> Everyone knows what a floating point number is? It's like an integer is a whole number, and a floating point is where you have like stuff behind the decimal point. So uh, I can super quickly show you. <laughs> if I have here uh, var a is an integer, a is uh, like two. That's allowed because two is a whole. Number. That's not allowed because I'm not using a. Here, that's allowed because it's a whole number. But if I say uh, 2.2, that's not going to be allowed. That's going to say like, hey, constant 2.2. Oh, it's actually it says truncated to an integer because an integer is only a whole number. So here I have to do a float 64, and then it's going to say, oh, that's fine because a floating point, like something behind the decimal point, is a floating point, and Go has float 64, which uses 64 bits, or a float 32, which only uses 32 bits, so 2.2 is fine for both, because it's like really fits easily in, but usually you would want to use 64 bits, because then you have much more precision, but I'm definitely not going to explain how floating points work now. <laughs> um, in Go, you have something like a struct tag, 
uh, and a struct tag is just some extra information I'm giving to this. So here I'm actually using a struct tag I made up myself, CSV name. So who is interested in what you are? Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm explaining this for the guy who's on the toilet. Okay. It's fine. I'll keep explaining what it does. So what we're actually going to want to write is a Marshall CSV function as I call it, which okay interface is okay, so Go is statically typed where every variable has a fixed type. Except for you can use the type interface, which means it can have any type. Interface is sort of like you have in PHP and other programming languages. So here I'm saying data can basically be any type. You don't use that very often in Go, but um, oh wait, I can. What I can quickly do here? Let's do some JSON endpoints. So. Uh, I'm going to do http.handle func slash json is a json handler. So I'm adding a new function, a new uh, endpoint, a new URL, which is going to return json. Um, json handler. Let's just copy this because I'm lazy. Okay, I want to do some JSON. Uh, okay, go also, of course, it has JSON. Yeah, okay, encoding JSON is the package called. Okay, let's import the package. So, encoding JSON. Oops, sorry. Okay, what does that have? It has stuff which you call Marshall. So, I have here a uh, where's my Marshall function? Oh, what? Why can't I see? Sorry, all the way on top here. It has a Marshall function which gets a variable of any type and it returns me a byte array. So I can use that. Um, let's make m is a map of string to string and I'm gonna say last visit Jason is always more with underscores. Last visitor is going to be last visitor. So I'm making a map here from string to string and I'm saying the key with last visitor is going to be last visitor. And now I want to make that into JSON. So I say uh, my uh, the bytes that I get back and the error is JSON. The function was called. Marshall, as you can see, again it has like that second error browser which most Go functions have. Marshall, what do I want to marshal? My map M. Okay, if error is the always handle your errors. Now I kind of say like that is an internal server error. I don't know if it's. I'm just gonna do 500. Much easier. <laughs> Return. Okay, I want to return JSON, so let's set the content type to JSON. Does anyone know the JSON content type? Of the the That's right. <laughs> okay, and now this one returned B, which was a byte array, right? So this is that byte array thingy. Huh, that's useful because this one also wants the byte array thingy always instead of the string. So I can just say, oh, byte B. Okay. Let's see. Go run. Of course, because I've run it again, it lost its state again. So let's just. Uh, oh, I can actually type something here. So Eric. Okay, that's fine. Now I'm going to go to the JSON endpoint. So I'm going to go to slash JSON. Of course, I don't know who uses Firefox here, but Firefox shows JSON data as well. Here you can see the raw data if you want. It has like a nice, nicer version. So actually, now oh, it's JSON data. I got JSON back here. I can even get more interesting JSON back if I want, because I have this map here. Uh, I can add more stuff to that. I can also say this is a map of, uh, I don't know, map of a map of a string to string. So, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna say, uh, oh, I don't know, data is a map from, so now I have this and then this one in here. 
So uh, there's also that's not going to work. What am I missing? Again, that trailing comma that's always required. So it's a bit more advanced type. So it's a map of string to a map of string to a string, which a data the, so the data entry I make a map to a string to a string, and then in there I get yeah okay whatever. Run it again. Uh, make sure it's like Eric again. And then to the JSON input, and hey, yeah, we have like data with init plus filter with Eric. If I look at the role, so you can see it's super easy in Go to convert like some map or some struct or whatever you have to JSON. And what I want to show with that is that that because well, I can also do this directly. Just change the last visitor. So now I'm not putting it in a map. I'm not doing anything fancy. So what am I getting back now? Let's say the Eric first. I'm getting back just a string Eric because that's also valid JSON. JSON doesn't have to start with a map or anything. Just a string is also valid JSON. So as you can see, before I gave it a map or a map of a map, and now a string. So it you want to give it any type of data so that's why go has the interface interface can be any type of data you want you were interested in reflect good your back so what i'm going to write is i'm going to write a marshall csv function so instead of marshalling my data to json i want to output it in csv format so i'm getting an interface because i can get all kinds of data as out I'm not going to work with that byte array thingy. I'm going to keep it simple and just return a string. And of course, an error if something goes wrong. Uh, my data, I want something. So obviously, it's CSV. So let's always have an array as data. So I have here that structs of type uh, product. Here I say I have an array of products where the first element is a product with name full price 13.37. And the second is a product bar, which is price 12. Here you can also see that there's two different ways to create structs in Go. One is where I say specifically like name is foo and price is this. The other way is where I just give it values in the same order as I declared here. So I want to marshal that data that I have here to something. Of course, again, when there's an error, I'm going to handle it. This time I'm going to handle it by just crashing. Panic is just Go's version of a just crash, basically. And if it doesn't crash, I'm going to print out. So here I'm going to expect, I want something like name, price, foo. So you can see there's exactly this here, where that name and that price is should get here, name and price. Okay, so use reflect. We are going to need to use reflect because here we have no idea what this is. Right. So in Go for that to have the reflect package. Let's import the reflect package. So I want to know what it is. Okay, let's go to the reflect package. What do we have here? Reflect. You can look at values, you can look at type. So we have a value here, so let's have here of oh, reflect has like value of an interface and it returns a reflect of value so okay rd is reflect dot value of data okay now basically because it's a csv we always want it to be an array or a slice as it's going to go so let's do an if rd okay we want to get the type of rd so what do we have here Okay, here we have type, but type actually returns a type. What is type? That's some advanced stuff. We don't want that yet. We want kind. Don't ask me why. And kind function actually returns a kind, and that's just all the built-in types of Go. So here we're interested in a slice. So let's say, oh. so if our e dot kind, is different than reflect.slice then we're going to return an empty string and an error like with uh, data is not a slice so that's our first case that can be an error okay now we know for sure that's a slice okay what is it a slice of 
Uh, well, let's handle one other case first. If R and B, so we know it's a slice. R B is a value. We can use length. Returns the length, V's length. It panics if kind is not blah, blah, one of these. Well, kind we already know it's slice, so it's never gonna panic. So this is fine. Okay. Oops, sorry. So let's check if R B dot length is uh, zero. Return <coughs> empty string. So if it's an empty slice, then we're just not gonna do anything for now. Now I want to, here in my example thingy, I had this nice CSV header with name and price, which I got out of this struct tag, as it's called. So let's try to get that. So let's say we want, I don't know, we could do something with type. I'm going to do it a little bit easier this time. We have index here. Hey, it returns the V element, V's I element. It panics if it's not how it does. It doesn't panic because we already know it's a slice. Okay. So, okay, so let's do a value zero is RV dot index zero. So now we have the zero with value. So of this array, the zero with value is a product. So, okay. Let's see what product has. So we actually want to print out the name here. So we're interested in something that is called a struct tag. Now, here we see oh, sorry. struct tags. Uh, oh, here we have struct tag. How do we get a struct tag? Let's find, find, find. Oh, hey, struct field has a tag, which is a struct tag. Oh, how do we get a struct field? Struct field, struct field. Mm. Ah, field of what? That's of type. Okay, so so if we do the v zero type is v zero dot type. Okay, and then we have that type. I can share this later. <laughs> okay, we have the type. And type had like uh, what, what was I looking at? Type has like for each field. Okay, how many fields does it have? It probably has something like none fields. Okay, number of fields. Okay, so here we have the number of fields. So let's do a for loop. Or i is zero, i is less than v num of type dot num field, i dot dot plus plus. So here we're going over each field, and then we can get the fields. Okay, so the uh, I don't know, field, uh, field value, no, wait, field type is. Uh, the v0 type dot field i. Is that the best we can do? Maybe not. Maybe we should. No, okay, can do that. So now we have the field type, and then we know if we have that. Sorry? Yeah, let's, so we have struct field here, and struct field has tag. Okay, so. Tag is at the dot tag. Okay, then we have that struct tag. And what did struct tag have that has this useful key? We want to get key. So name is tag dot get CSV. So here, because I used CSV here, I could also use Eric here, and then I don't have to use Eric here, but of course we use CSV here. So actually, that JSON package that I just showed, if you use that, then it has a thing, a struct tag called JSON. So you can say in JSON, in my code, this is name, but in JSON, it's like a blah, for example. So you can change what its name is going to be in JSON. And at the same time, I can add more here. I can also say like XML is, uh, I don't know, like a 
Ooh, so I can use the same struct for different formats. And by the way, just as easy as uh, the JSON thing was, it's exactly the same for uh, XML. So if you're handling XML, it's also super easy and go. So, okay, here I have the name, but of course I could also have, uh, let's say if Pride doesn't have anything, that's of course also possible. So let's do if name is empty string, then name is empty. So this was that field, uh, the, the type of field uh, this many. So that also has a name. So that's then gonna be so if that tag is missing, I'm going to use price here, so ft.name. Okay, so now I have the name for each thing, but of course I want to do something with that. I want to print it, but I want to print it with commas in between, so I could of course do something like uh, some out string uh, plus its name uh, plus a comma. But of course, you don't know, you don't want the comma at the last, so you would have to do something like uh, if i is uh, lower than uh, complex, let's not do that. Let's do names. I make an array of, what, I don't even have to make that, an array of strings. And here I'm gonna say names is append names name. So now, after this loop, this will be an array of all those names. I want to return something at some point, so let's make some, uh, I, know, I call it red. Uh, we're going to return a string, but let's start with something from the strings package. And the strings package has to join. So I'm going to join that array with commas in between. <coughs> Okay, let's return red and new format. Is that going to work? Yeah, run. What's it going to return? Oh, blah and price. Oh, I saw blah here. Name. Run. So, hey, that already works. That's nice. Now we need to add the values to here. So, we already know we have this length here of the slice. So, let's do the, I don't know, the zero. Is less than the length, I plus plus, so we're gonna loop over all those values. So vi is uh, here we did our we did index zero, so here we're gonna do index i and now we now we need this is now one of these products, so we need again for each field we need to do something so let's copy this thing but now instead of course like j i don't know if everyone does that okay so now each field and then here we already had but here we got the field from the type so can we also get the value instead do we have that so value uh, also has uh, I don't even know what it's called. Oh, field. I get the field. So okay, and then we get a value back. Oh, sorry. So uh, the vi value is uh, vi dot field i. So that's now the value. But of course, we have a value. We don't have the actual value. So maybe value. Wait, let's go to all the overview. So this is the overview of value. Does it have like a string method? Did I just look over it? Yeah, it has a string. Returns fees underlying value. Now, okay, that sounds like what we want. So we actually are interested in this two string. Oh, and again, we need to do the same thing as we did here, but now we do here like values. It has no bar. Value is an array of strings, and here I don't know. Value is that, and then value uses a pen. Value, value. Okay, so now we have all those values, and then we do rats plus is uh, strings dot join values. Comma 
separated again, and that's a new line to it, and also here, also you want to start on the other. So of course now the last uh, character in the in the output will always be a new line, but I think that's a good thing. So well, let's try again. Format it. The file run. Okay, that's not what we expected. So. That's apparently this string thingy isn't working. Why is that not working? Returns feed underlying value as a string. The string is a special case that goes with blah 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 blah. blah. Uh, if kind is it, so if it's not a string, it's going to return like some really weird shit. Okay, we don't want that. What do we want instead? So interface. yes, exactly. So we have interface here. So interface returns V's current value as an interface. Yeah, okay, that's nice. We can do something with that interface. And now, if I look at the FMT package, you will see FMT can also print all kinds of stuff. But of course, it also has the sprintf function. And sprintf returns the string instead of printing it. And as you can see, it has like an interface. Like this is can have many interfaces as argument. So let's use that. So let's do fnt.sprint and now I'm interested in the string value. I'm not sure if this is gonna work. I think so. Let's try this. So now I'm just taking this interface and turning it into a string using sprint app. Is this gonna work? No, it's not gonna work because percent s expects a string, but I'm giving it a float. So let's do v for any value. So run. And he definitely made some mistake somewhere. V zero d, v zero d. Right here, I take the i. The I yeah, but I want the i elements. Oh, here, so sorry. Here I need, to, I, I'm always taking the. No, this is correct. Oh, here. Smart. Okay, if I do this. Hey, it works. So, name, price, full, Okay, but because we are working with interface, we can do, and we're working with the flag packs, we can easily expand this to do more. So, if instead of this data, I might also want to support like data is, uh, I don't know, an array of an array of strings. An array of strings. Bar. Uh, So maybe I also want to support this, but now if I'm going to run it, yeah, let's go to panic, of course, because num fields or a non type, so it's crashing on uh, line 30. What is line 30? Yeah, here I'm getting num fields, but it's a string, so that's definitely not going to work. So here I need to do if. Uh, v0 type of kind is a uh, reflect of structs. Uh, let's do this. Well, still gonna crash on names. Yeah, of course, now I have to move that part out. So I'm gonna say that is an empty string. And I'm only gonna append the names to it if it's actually a struct. Because, of course, with if I have an array of strings, now I have no idea what I need to use as a header, so I'm just gonna ignore the header completely. So I'm um, gonna move this in here, run. Still gonna crash because I'm still doing null fields on line 51. Yeah, it's still gonna go wrong. So here also I do uh, if it's a struct, then I'm going to handle this as a struct. Else, I don't know. Let's first do return uh, uh, empty string and do error f. Card handle uh, uh, array value whatever. And here I'm going to do else if 
if that kind is, uh, if that's a slice again, let's form up it quickly. If it's a slice, then oh yeah, okay, we already knew how to handle slices, so we do the same as this. We already knew how to handle that, and then of course this needs to be our i not that. So now we know our uh, vi. Vi is a is a <coughs> is a slice again. So we're going to get each value of that slice, and then uh, div is now going to be a vi dot the index j instead of getting field j we're getting the element at index j and then well, I could probably do the same here so of course I could probably move this code out of there somewhere but it's a lot of that for now run oh, okay that already works does it also work for integers now <coughs> data is an array of an array of integers Let's swipe integers, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, two, oh, yeah. uh, sorry, four ones. Uh, assign a new variable. <laughs> oh, and that also immediately works. So by using the reflect package and looking at what this is, we can like, support all kinds of data types and stuff at the same time. So usually you wouldn't use reflect if you write Go because reflect is quite slow because it has to like do all kinds of lookups of internal types and whatnot. But for stuff like this, where you have a function that needs to accept like any type of argument, it's very useful. So in a standard library, like I said, with the print function always accepts an interface because it has everything. Uh, those Marshall functions accept everything. Oh, by the way, if you're working with JSON, you also have unmarshal, which does the opposite. Like it takes the JSON string and puts it in a struct, and then it's also smart about what it's doing there. Uh, yeah, that's basically the reflect package. Does that explain it more for you? Uh, and are there any questions about this or about the, the HTTP code, for example? Or anyone wants to know anything? Yeah, I know, but this is much more fun to do it like this. Yeah, what he says. Uh, if you have, uh, where is that, uh, where did I have to, if you go to the documentation for request, you see it actually has a form value method, which just gets a key, form value returns the value of the name component of the post and put body, but it actually doesn't get from get. I also thought it did. Well, the useful thing of, huh? Ah, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, it also does. Which Otherwise, I wanted to say, like I said, with Go, that the uh, Go is written in Go, so we could also just click on form value and see what it actually does. So it looks, if it has a form, uh, it tries to parse that with some memory defaults. Okay, what does parse multi parse form do? So actually this one yeah. does a whole bunch of stuff to parse what you're posting or whatever so it gets parse form at some point. What does parse form do? Probably up here. So uh, this actually gets looks at what kind of method it is. And at some point I expect, oh yeah, here are the URLs of parse query, the function we actually used just now, we use this exact line here, where was it? Here, URL the parse query, r the URL the work query, hey, it's exactly the same as the internal Go library uses to parse it. So, as you can see, you can just go into the function and see what it actually does, we want to go with it and go. Uh, I think that's it. I hope I didn't go too fast. I
what we did with some stuff for the more beginners. I don't know. I think maybe this group is a bit not suited to do like a really slow introduction because most of you already have some experience. But I hope um, something was useful for you. Yeah, so you have been a lot of live stream all day. <laughs> so, watching the lecture. Okay. Uh, I think that's about it. Sorry for being a bit of a good announcement. The next few yeah. months I will be gone again, probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll take over. Any, any guys, uh, you guys, uh, any defectors or uh, please or uh, anything that you guys want to know more about? Yeah, because of topics that you want to focus on. Because uh, otherwise, it's like, try to be a bit flexible and make sure that at least uh, everyone gets something away from the meetups. Or, uh, and we are recording it now, so it means is that we will post up the link to the YouTube videos. So hopefully, it's is that uh, any of the, the ones that's been uh, done before, is that uh, everyone for the next meetup will be able to catch up on different, for instance, and have some questions regarding them. So at least, uh, we can actually uh, continue.